how a pandemic side project turned into a full-time income stream, earning up to 40 grand a month. What's up? What's up? Nick Loper here. Welcome to the Side Hustle Show. It's the entrepreneurship podcast. You can actually apply. And today we've got a killer case study for you today, uh, where my guest took inspiration from uh, a previous guest, but more importantly than that, took action on it. That guest was Alex Goldberg from Finn versus Finn. He was on episodes 367 and 410 of the Side Hustle Show, where we broke down the model of what we called the modern comparison shopping site. In-depth product reviews and comparisons that help buyers make informed decisions and earn affiliate commissions on those referrals. So my hope is that armed with the information in this episode, you'll be the one in the guest chair a couple years from now. But for today, it is Matt Oni from zenmasterwellness.com. Matt, welcome to the Side Hustle Show. Thanks very much, Nick. Happy to be here. You bet. So you saw what Alex was doing, you saw how much they were earning, and you thought, you know what, I'm pretty good at SEO. I can figure this stuff out. Now, what was the next step? How did you figure out like what niche to go into or the subcategory that you wanted to really carve out a space in? Fortunately, like you like you mentioned, I'm I'm good friends with Alex. Um, so I was fortunate enough to kind of follow his journey along with Finn versus Finn. Um, and of course, he was also in the in the health and wellness niche that I'm in. Um, and so I had a, a little bit of uh, an inside scoop. Uh, and Alex told me like, you know, hey, telemedicine. I've been watching the search volume and the, the Google trends and everything like that. And I'm, I'm starting to see uh, an increased uh, lift in kind of all things telemedicine. Um, so kind of based off that feedback, uh, we started looking into different brands and companies that, you know, we could potentially uh, cover on zenmasterwellness.com. And uh, from there, it's kind of just a no brainer. You know, like I was, I was very fortunate that uh, in a sense that the niche kind of came to me. Uh, I've always been passionate about uh, mental health in general. Um, I've also been a savvy shopper in general throughout my life. So the thought of creating an affiliate marketing based uh, review site in a niche that I was already passionate about um, was was pretty simple. Yeah, help people make those decisions, point them in the one, in the direction that. that is the right fit. It makes a lot of sense and something that you already have some interest and experience with. Was there anybody else doing it in this space? I mean, did you have any like competitive metrics or competitive analysis going into it? I don't really remember there being that much competition. Um, and the reason I say that is at least the first three articles that I ever published on Send Master Wellness were covering pretty new brands. Um, and that was nice for me because I was able to pretty quickly pump out some content reviewing and comparison, comparing these brands. And even as a very new site, I think within a month or two, uh, and this is a brand new domain, even within like a month or two, I was ranking number one uh, for my focus keywords, which anyone who's fairly familiar with SEO knows that that's pretty rare. But these ended up being very lucrative keywords. And here I was a brand new website ranking first. So yeah. uh, in that regard, competition was pretty scarce. Obviously, that's changed a lot nowadays where I'm kind of up against Forbes and Healthline.com and everything. But at right. the time, uh, it was it was very much a right place, right time uh, benefit for me. Yeah, this is the advantage that a scrappy solopreneur kind of has over these bigger media brands is that you can be first, you can be early to some of these up and coming brands that you know, are going to have, maybe they don't show a lot of search volume in this particular keyword research tools today, but you know, what's coming. And if you can be early on those, you kind of hopefully dig yourself in an entrenched position in the search results, you start to build some backlinks, start to build up some authority there. And that's something that Alex and Healy talked about. And that's something that uh, Tammy Smith talked about as well for Fit Healthy Mama, I think was her site, kind of mm -hmm. being an early adopter, kind of skating where the puck is going um, to a certain extent. And I, I don't know, do you have a, a process for, you know, coming up with, you know, what are those up and coming brands? Uh, you know, you're looking at the you know, the, the venture capital raise, like, oh, I know they're going to be pumping some money into marketing soon. So let's go and create that resource. Um, that was exactly our strategy. So I subscribed to probably four different email newsletters that would uh, publish, hey, here's a new list of, of uh, companies that just raised, you know, X dollars. Um, and I would sift through those newsletters each day. 
um, and then just got to give them the eye scan, right? Like if they're in my niche, uh, great, add it to like the first column uh, and then look deeper and, and decide, okay, well, are they direct to consumer or are they B2B? Um, in my case, I, I kind of flock towards the direct to consumer ones. So it was very much a, a research driven process, whereas nowadays it's kind of flipped and now I get countless brands reaching out to, to me in my inbox and saying, hey, we'd love to work together. So um, that was our strategy early on. It was very useful. Okay. And you said within a matter of weeks, months, like, can you have a sense of how long before you started to see your first meaningful traffic or, or affiliate income? Probably within three, uh, two or three months, I would say. Uh, we published one article in particular that was a comparison uh, of three different at-home smart gyms. Uh, we've seen commercials for them on TV and and things like that. Mirror uh, by Lululemon is like the biggest one. Okay. Uh, anyway, somehow, it still amazes me to this day that it wasn't covered, but somehow I was like one of the first, if not the first, um, to that you know piece of territory. And I wrote a really killer article at the time. Um, and it just blew up. You know, this was wow. the first time where I had obviously been casually checking GA for traffic trends and stuff. But this was the first like real spike, like, whoa, what just happened? Uh, and there was just a ton of search volume for it. Um, and I think, may so if that was July of 2020. Um, yeah, it's like peak pandemic time, like everybody's working yeah. out at home. Like it's a great place, a great space to be in. Yeah, yeah, timing was excellent. Um, but I actually didn't have, so A, I didn't have affiliate partnerships in place with all three of those companies yet. Um, eventually that did happen, but, uh, if that was July, I don't think it was until September or maybe October of that year before I actually saw my first dollar of okay. affiliate income. And that okay, was pretty yeah. awesome when I did. Even that, I want to caveat that that's still pretty fast. And we hear stories of being like, well, it was really you know, nine months before we got my first commission check, you know, it was the 12 months, you know, it was, and really kind of year two, it starts to take off and year three is kind of a inflection point. It's like, sometimes it takes a long time, but by being an early uh, contributor to the content surrounding these different brands and capitalizing into that, um, you know, existing demand or capturing that demand rather than trying to you know, create something from scratch. Like, here's why you need a home gym. It's like, no, I already want a home gym. I'm just trying to decide which brand is going to be the right one for me. So I'll give a couple quick plugs here. If you're ready to start a site of your own, Side Hustle website is where you go. That's my free guide on how to get yourself online quickly and affordably. And if you're new to the show, thank you for tuning in. Of course, I would love to have you binge on the entire 550 plus episode archives. But I also understand that might not be realistic. That might not be the fastest path to get you where you want to go. Instead, I want to invite you to uh, create your own personalized playlist at hustle.show. All you have to do is answer a few short multiple choice questions. I'll give you a custom curated mixtape that you can add to your device. Uh, you can see what works and you can start making more money. Again, that's at hustle.show. Now, Matt, you mentioned uh, an important thing. Well, what am I going to do with this traffic? And it's that affiliate relationship on the back end. And so a lot of these companies, especially early stage, they might not have these affiliate programs set up or in place. And you know, if they do, great, click the button, join the program or apply to join the program. But if they don't, then it's this kind of longer conversation trying to reach the right decision maker. Hey, can we set something up? Like what happens in those cases? This happens a lot. And it was actually one of the things that shocked me the most about being able to build this business up is I was able to watch uh, Alex and his ability to basically create affiliate partnerships out of thin air, right? <laughs> a lot of times he was talking to people who may have had experience with affiliate marketing in the past, but probably more often than not didn't have any experience. And so he would actually start out by kind of coaching them and saying like, hey, you don't need to pay impact however much it is to get on impact radius or share sale or any of the major affiliate platforms. Okay. He walk them through the process of just, hey, we could just use Google Analytics for this kind of thing. And you could just set up click tracking and we can report on a monthly basis and we'll invoice you accordingly. Wow. Um, so he he did a lot of handholding and, and we've actually done that um, a lot 
throughout the past few years. And it's obviously been, you know, it's probably a little bit more of a headache for him early on. Um, but he's probably also done it so many times that he doesn't care, but it, it's been, it's been lucrative and, you know, he's just kind of spreading knowledge. Well, I think that's an important point to pause on because that limits the competition in a way where, you know, the easy button, you know, webmaster is looking for that off the shelf affiliate program through impact, through share sale. And it's like, well, if they don't have it, or if it's not easily listed in their footer, am I really going to go through the effort of trying to find their marketing director and, well, we could set up something through custom Google analytics track. Like, I don't even know how to do that. So by going through those extra steps, you're like, okay, now not only do we have that relationship that other people, maybe they're not going to create that content because they don't have that relationship. And now we can go out and not only create it, but monetize it as well. And it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a no brainer because it's like a performance based uh, thing. Affiliate marketing is like, well, you know, what, what, what do you typically pay to acquire a customer? Great. We can match that. You know, let's go. Um, so that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, spot on. And now today you've got brands reaching out to you. Do you end up charging like a flat, fee or like, Hey, send us some product, you know, for a flat fee, we'll, you know, build out this listing or do you still do everything kind of on that affiliate performance basis? First and foremost, if there's a brand that we stumble upon and we're like, you know, like it's, it's hot, they're advertising a lot. We check the search volume. It's great. We think it perfectly aligns with our niche. We'll just sprint after that. Right. Um, but unfortunately, those are kind of a, a diamond in the rough a lot of times. So um, in the instance that a brand reaches out to us, um, if we have bandwidth, um, and that's to say if our content calendar isn't like too um, backed up, then sure, we can fit them in. You know, it might be in two, three, four, five weeks. Um, in the seasons where our content calendar is just absolutely loaded, then we will give uh brands the option to uh cut in line for lack of a better term right so we'll say hey uh this is the fee that uh you're up against right now like if you want to pay 500 bucks or whatever it is um then we can you know publish sooner and then we just work with them that way yeah this is really cool i never really have done that but i've heard of other people doing it so i just was curious because it's like oh yeah we get inbound a lot from different brands like hey would you create this product review it's like well, that's a lot of work <laughs> to do to, to do all that do all that research and stuff but yeah if you want to skip the line or if you want to pay up front for that featured placement uh, you know yeah i think that's an interesting way to do that and did it in some other kind of we'd have featured listings on another site that i ran kind of like you would see on Yelp or TripAdvisor, you know, something somebody could pay to kind of be at the top of the ranks and cut the line in that way. But mm -hmm. from the content calendar standpoint, have yet to do that. So that's that's helpful. Um, yeah, and, and real quick, that's actually really the only place we do it, right? So that that impacts the prioritization within our content calendar. But what we don't do is kind of the Yelp strategy, where it's like, hey, you could pay X dollars and you can be featured on the top of this list. We don't really do that because, well at least in, in my opinion, that can sometimes affect, you know, if you have like a best VPNs listicle and you're just selling placements for the number one, two, three spot, it can get a little dicey and that can potentially influence, you know, just the overall integrity of the article. So I generally don't like to do that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if a brand is willing to pay 500, a thousand bucks um, to get a new piece of content, on the internet about them like sooner. Um, and that's a priority for them. Then yeah, we've, we've seen it happen plenty of times where, where they're more than happy to pay for that. And in a lot of cases, these brands just have a set marketing budget that the marketing manager and their team has been given a mandate to deploy. And they're like, well, where, where are we going to, where are we going to put this stuff? And so they're, you have, they have money to spend in a lot of cases. Um, and I, and I do appreciate that, right? If you are going to sell a featured listing, you know, make sure that is disclosed because that's something that you've done a nice job of on your site. Like, Hey, look, you know, unbiased reviews, expert opinions, like this is, you know, we're not, we're not to be bought, although we are monetizing with affiliate relationships, similar to a wire cutter, like, Hey, we test this stuff, you know, this is why, this is why you ought to trust us and all that stuff. Is there a minimum search volume that you'd like to see for creating something, you know, if, if a brand hasn't proactively reached out to cut the line, like when you're building out that content calendar, is there 
uh, certain metrics that you're looking for? It can vary based on how I feel day to day or or whatever. But but of, and it it also would vary on like your niche and the average order value and things like that. But yeah, I guess one of the primary factors would be like, okay, what is the expected AOV from someone making a purchase, right? So if it's like a smart home gym where we're talking about a two or three thousand dollar unit, the search volume can potentially be a lot lower uh, versus if you're you know writing about an electric razor that's twenty or thirty bucks, you're going to end up getting a much smaller affiliate cut out of that. Um, so ideally, you would like to see a much much higher search volume. Um, okay. because you're just going to need more readers to that article, right? So with that being said, um, there are like certain search volume metrics that stick out in my mind. Um, for the most part, I would look for a search volume of like 400 searches per month. Um, that would be great. Like if I saw 400 and I would use the Google Analytics keyword planner tool uh, generally instead of like Ahrefs or anything like that uh, for precise search volume metrics. Um, but if I saw like 400, I'd be like, great, this is worth my time. It's going to go on the content calendar. Um, okay. 200 would be a stretch. 800 was that magic number where it's just skipping the line, going straight up to the to the top of my content <laughs> calendar. Um, but of course those metrics, there's, it's it, the search volume itself. Isn't the only variable at play. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Are you paying any attention to the competitiveness metric or that side of it? Yeah. So, uh, I know Ahrefs and I'm sure all the other SEO tools out there give, uh, some sort of competitive metric. I usually don't even look at it cause I don't like to be, uh, overwhelmed by the infinite metrics that they do give you, <laughs> sure. um, but I'll, I'll go with a, a gut test. So I'll just plug that keyword straight into Google uh, in an incognito browser and uh, feel things out myself. So then I get a few. And generally, you know, as you build your site out more and more, you have a feel for like where you're reasonably going to rank. Obviously, your intention is to always, always, always create the best possible piece of content on the internet for a given keyword, but we all know that that's not really enough. Like a lot of times I'm not going to beat Forbes, right? right. Um, even, even though you so, may have more topical authority because they go so broad, but it's just, you can't compete with that level of domain authority. Yeah. You never know. I have beaten, you know, PC mag and insider and big, big websites before. Um, but I don't know why, you know, I just have to kind of go based off what I do think I know about SEO because obviously no one's a SEO guru. Um, but yeah, I, I go with that gut test um, and I just look at SERPs myself. And um, if I say, hey, I think I can rank number three for this, then of course you can kind of backtrack and say, okay, well, I could expect whatever, 10% of um, those searches to click through to my website. And then it's like, okay, well, if that has 800 search volume, I might expect 80 per month. Um, and then depending on uh, the product or brand itself, then I can at least start to guesstimate um, how many page views and how much affiliate revenue might come from that. It's just a guessing game. Yeah, that's right. And you end up ranking for all these long tail variations. So even if it says, you know, the search tool might say 400 searches a month, like you could end up getting 10 times that volume of traffic for all the different variations that may or may not be included in, in that volume. And I like this incognito browser, browser test. You kind of get a sense of like, well, who am I realistically up against? I look at those specific uh, titles that they're using. Well, is anybody targeting this exact variation in their titles? Like, if not, that's a good sign. If there are, you know, forums, you know, are there reddits, you know, reddit threads up there? It's like, oh, okay, that might not be super relevant topical authority. That might be something worth tackling um, as well. But uh, how many are, I mean, there's, I, it, it appears from the outside looking in like hundreds of articles, they're all like really in depth. Like do you have a sense of the volume, the volume of content that you've created here? But it's actually not as high as you think. I think I might have right around the, the 50 number. Okay. I would have guessed higher. It looks, but they're all very detailed, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for saying that. I, I, I have also, you know, part of that is I've always held uh, content quality to a high standard. Uh, one, because that's what Google says they want. But two, um, because that's what I like to read. 
Um, and uh, my approach to publishing content has pretty much always been, um, I like to write uh, in a way and create content in a way that I myself as a reader would enjoy. Um, and that presents itself in multiple ways. Like, obviously it should be entertaining. I don't really hold back from making jokes or letting the, you know, occasional swear word through. Um, but I also like to, you know, as I mentioned before, I've always been kind of cheap, uh, kind of sometimes like price savvy and things like that. So, um, if I notice that other competition in SERPs hasn't presented pricing information in a certain intuitive way for a, a uh, potential buyer, then I'll make sure to include that. Like if it's kind of hard to put into words, but if I'm viewing the buying decision in a certain light, um, I'm going to publish it in that light. Cause I think that there's probably a lot of other people that kind of think about the same things the way I do. Yeah. And that's one way to differentiate yourself from everybody else out there from all the AI content that if it's not out there already is bound to be coming down the road. It's like, I was on your article on like Viome, like whatever, like the gut health one. He's like, mm -hmm. Hey, uh, you know, you start off. I never thought I'd be writing about, you know, stool sample testing companies, but here we are. <laughs> it just kind of goes, it's like, it just kind of humanizes it in a way that a lot of online content doesn't like it's very cut and dry. So I think that helps it stand out. Um, and that is actually encouraging only 50 ish articles. Like, okay. That's a reasonable body of work to go out and create and to build this uh, asset that not only pays you month, but also has equity, um, you know, in terms of if you were to turn around and, and sell it, I think it's really exciting. Um, anything else as you're going through this content planning calendar, you know, it can be a sense of like, well, are you spending time updating the old content? Because some people are always gunning for your position in the SERPs, or are you prioritizing a new content? Now, what's what's a day in the life? Yeah, so so this is actually one uh, trap that I think I fell into um, over the last few years. Is for a long, long time I did not prioritize updating old content, um, and that's obviously for a few reasons. But the biggest one is. I was always thinking about how I can grow, go, grow. So I would, for the most part, only give a serious effort towards updating old content if I noticed a dip in rankings or a dip in conversion rate and therefore affiliate income on a, on a given yeah. article, uh, which I think makes sense. You know, I think a lot of people would have done the same thing, but um, pretty much beginning this past December, um, I met with Alex and, and, uh, our content editor, Jane, and we, we made a really serious push towards, like we saw that our content had gotten a little bit stale. Um, and, uh, there was no like cohesive brand along my very first few articles and the ones that I was publishing in December. Um, and so it's kind of just like a, wake up call. And it was also around the holidays where we thought we had some time to do this push. Um, and we actually did spend a lot of time towards, uh, updating our existing content. Obviously it's nowhere near done. Um, and we do also need to make sure that like moving forward, we need to be updating content on some regular cadence. Uh, but I think it is super, super important. And obviously it comes right back to like, if we want to be creating the best content out there, we can't just update content when a brand changes their logo or when there's like a serious pricing change. Um, but you kind of, you got to be on, on your game always. Yeah. You almost have to sign up for the Google alerts for all these different brands, the newsletter lists for all these different brands, just so you get a sense of well, what are the new features that they've added? You know, what are the pricing updates? You know, just to be on the pulse of that because, you know, the other people are updating that stuff. It's like, well, I don't want to read the, you know, Apple Watch review from 2017. I want the 2023 version. And like in kind of being able to have that last updated timestamp in the search results, I imagine influences uh, the perceived relevance and the click-through rates and all that jazz. So it, it becomes... Uh, a, a work in itself to just to keep everything up to date as that body of content grows, but that's helpful. And so you mentioned you had an editor on your team. Are you doing most of the writing yourself? You have outsourced writers. How do you approach that? 
when I started the website, I was doing everything myself. Um, I was writing, I was editing, I was creating the blog posts themselves. Um, we'll say that was maybe for the first 10 articles because it's a nice round number. From there, I was like, okay, well, <laughs> my col content calendar is only getting bigger, so I need some help. So um, I would just hit up friends or like make an Instagram story and be like, hey, does anyone want to make, you know, some beer money? You want a couple hundred bucks? Um, I templatized instructions on like how to write an article. Uh, for the most part, they were basically doing all of the research for me, which was a huge value add. Um, but then from there, um, because I had gotten a lot of positive feedback on my style of writing, I would take their draft, but it was essentially um, a lot of research, and then I would edit that myself and publish it. Um, and then from there, the logical next step was to actually uh, find a third-party um, freelance writing service that I could use. So um, I ended up choosing one of those, uh, formerly known as ContentFly, I think, today they're called draft um and they've been they've been super good um it's like a, i think it's a i don't know if it's a productized service or if it's um an actual agency that uh staffs in-house writers um okay. but regardless they set me up with with really talented writers um who are able to pump out articles pretty quickly and then we have jane to uh edit them from there Okay, that's a new one for me. Draft is someone that I haven't heard of. It's it's a constant pain point for me. Like I've got this long list of you know keywords I'm reasonably confident that I could write for, but every time I look at it, it's like, well, that's going to take four or five hours. It's like, well, you know, is there a um, is there somebody else who could create this as well or better than I could? And you know, I could go through that editing process, and maybe that's faster than just starting it completely from you know blank page, blinking cursor, and then. Yep. Um, there's this element of content marketing ROI where if I'm paying 150, 250 bucks for this article to get created, like I've got to have a sense of, you know, the potential break even window on that. Like how long until that turns into a profitable endeavor. And if you're doing a ton of content volume wise, and it's like, well, I'm, I'm cash flow negative in the near term. Like, do you think about that in any way? In the back of my mind, I definitely do. Right. So I know that there is a cost associated with writing any piece of content or allocating any existing resources towards. Um, but no, because I've done, you know, in the keyword research phase, I'm kind of doing all of that auditing and saying, okay, this one's going to be worth our time. This one, probably not. Maybe we could put it in the very back of our co content calendar, but I've already kind of sorted through the list at that point in time. Um, and so inherently that I've already done that kind of calculation of like, okay, it's, it's worth uh, 150 or 200 bucks that we are paying for the writing. Um, could I do more of that? Yeah, for sure. Um, could I do more like general ROI analysis of all of our different marketing efforts? For sure. Yeah. Um, but you know, there's only so many hours in the day. Um, and that just hasn't turned out to be like the largest priority. Also, the one thing I will add to that is, I, you know, for a long, long time, Zen Master was a side hustle for me. Um, and I was just loving it, right? Like we were pushing really good numbers. Um, and for the first time ever, I felt uh, like financially free. And so the thought and, and everything was going great, you know, number was just going up and to the right. Like, yeah. So I fell into the trap of like, I don't need to reinvest like profits into the business. Like everything's going great. Like, sure. I have outsourced writers now and they're making my job way, way easier. Um, but I didn't need to make any like huge financial investments back into the business today. That has changed a lot. Um, and of course I wish I had, I had, reinvested profits a lot sooner. Um, and part of that, now that we're, you know, reinvesting a lot of money, we are spending a lot more time on like the ROI analysis of our marketing efforts. You say the, the picture has changed a bit. I mean, the site has lost rankings, lost traffic, lost revenue. What's, what's going on? 
yeah so uh traffic in general is down for sure um but that's not super super alarming obviously there are a ton of different factors that can go into um lost traffic and lost rankings um but we've you know because of the nature of our niche a lot of times we're you know for lack of a better term we're chasing trends uh we're always like targeting new new companies so a lot of these companies fail um and that can often mean you know what previously used to have been a keyword with a thousand monthly searches now sees zero um things like that just kind of compound over time so traffic is dipped yeah, yeah. um but the bigger uh more noticeable uh, decline has been in revenue, you know, so at, at our peak, we were, um, we were seeing over $40,000 in, uh, monthly revenue, which was basically profit mostly. Um, and today we're, we're back down to like the 15 to $20,000, uh, per month, uh, revenue, Yeah, which is, which is definitely scary, but um, it's a volatile business, right? Like, it's, it's, and also it's a ton of money. So now here I'll, I'll kick that back and like, what if it had never gone to 40 and what if you were just at 15, like, Oh, I built this thing on the side. That's now bringing in 15 to 20 grand a month. Like, would you be happier in that sense? Or are you happier like knowing what it could be and have it come back down a little bit? I just, it's always fascinating to get people's takes on that. I'm glad that we reached those high heights uh even if i like didn't have any of that money today i would still be glad that we had hit those because that has proven to me like what can be achieved and it's crazy thinking that this was just a side hustle for so long yeah. um, but that also because we hit those numbers that gave me the confidence to leave my full-time position i had been working for a tech startup for seven years maybe Okay. Um, and I had reached a point in my career where, you know, I was doing valuable work and I absolutely loved my coworkers, but it was taking a very intense, uh, toll on my mental health. And I was just like, for the first time ever, I was feeling legitimately burned out. Um, and I had lost, you know, my passion for, uh, for the role that I had since college. Um, and so my point is, reaching these super amazing levels of revenue was uh, very much the catalyst for me having the courage to leave that job and just pursue Zen Master full time. Um, and all money aside, it's been such an like, incredible learning experience and growing experience um, that I'm just grateful for that and that alone. Yeah, it shows you what is possible, or I would probably be in that same boat where it's like, well, it's a little bit depressing to have business be doing half of what you know it could do or what it did in the past but it's still a great living and i should be grateful for that but you're like oh you know so that's a like motivation to get back to it to get it back to those levels and beyond so appreciate exactly. you yeah. being it's motivating yeah appreciate the the transparency about that i was going to ask if you guys have ever done in the history of the site any proactive link building or it's like we are just going to you know live and die by the strength of our content link building is very difficult obviously um especially for affiliate marketing websites because it's like do you actually have content that people want to link to um right <laughs> early on i can only really remember a couple organic backlinks that i saw come in that i was like pretty stoked on one of them uh well one of them was um was through haro and the other was like a purely organic, some university student had uh, used one of my articles as like a academic resource in some academic paper. It was a student at Harvard. I was like, holy crap, that's awesome. Wow, I got a backlink from Harvard. Yeah, I even try. so cool. Yeah. Uh, and it was like legit organic. Um, and I was like stoked, but I was obviously like, that's never going to happen again. So yeah, slap that up on the, you know, as seen on like social proof. Uh, I, did. Badge thing. I did actually. <laughs> nice. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. But, uh, since then haven't seen any more Harvard links come in. So, uh, what we do is we work with, um, uh, a handful of, you know, personal trainers, nutritionists, dietitians, um, 
and they work on Haro Links for us. So that has been awesome for um, generating what are legitimately organic backlinks to our website. Um, and, you know, we have them as medical reviewers of our content and they're submitting these Haros and like creating legit value for uh, other media websites. And we're benefiting from, you know, often 90 plus DR backlinks to our site. That's really interesting. Talk to me a little bit more about how that works. So you've created kind of this review board of experts in the health and wellness space, and they're responding to the help a reporter inquiries on somewhat on their own behalf, because they have their own standalone brands and businesses, but also, you know, kind of this handshake agreement to, well, if you can mention Zen Master in our product review, make sure to do that too. And how are you paying them for that? Yeah, so so it, it varies on, on who we're working with, but I mean, it can be as simple as uh, we pay a, a uh, monthly fee for them to contract out and submit HAROs on behalf of Zen Master Wellness, right? Like they're a member of our review board. Um, in that sense, they're absolutely a member of our team. Um, and they submit HAROs. It could be, you know... Uh, Livestrong.com writing about the top uh, five calf training exercises, um, and they could submit a haro for that. And um, because they're such excellent writers, like very often they'll uh, be featured on the article, and and they mention, of course, that um, you know if you link to or if you uh, include my piece of uh, feedback in your article, I'd love a backlink back to our website, sunmasterwellness.com or fin versus fin.com. But it was a it was a, a real grind finding um, such stars in this regard. Like the, Haro is extremely difficult um, in general, and so to find dietitians and nutritionists and personal trainers whose forte might not be writing content or PR um, was was a struggle. So we're very fortunate that we have such a strong team. How do you go about finding those people? It's tough. When you find one, oftentimes they'll have, you know, personal connections or work colleagues um, who are also interested in making, I mean, this is their side hustle sometimes too, right? Like they might have colleagues who are also interested in earning some side income uh, from sendmasterwellness.com. Um, and, you know, it's worth their time to submit Haros that way. Um, at one point in time, I... Uh, sponsored a friend of mine to complete his personal training certification because I knew that he was kind of extremely passionate about health and wellness in general uh, and physical fitness. And so I said, hey, um, I'd love to just sponsor you to actually get the certification that you want to pursue. Um, and he submits ours on, on our behalf as well. Um, but yeah, are you flagging it, in those that regard, like as they as they come them. into your inbox? Are you scrolling through to see if there's anything that's a fit, or they that's part of their agreement that they're looking for those uh, proactively? Yeah. Uh, so I early on, um, I would look for them and send them out and say, "Hey, would you mind?" Like I identified these haros. I think you should give it a shot. Okay. Okay. That that did not work because with haro you have to be so swift like the writers of these articles want want input and they want it now yeah. um so, sometimes they were aiming to publish an article like the next day so there just wasn't enough time for so much back and forth uh so today i don't i don't look at haro at all uh our review team does and i guess this is alex's latest project at authoritygenius.com trying to match up experts who are looking for a side hustle with publishers like yourself who kind of need those experts to, you know, fact check and vet their articles and potentially even do this kind of uh, PR outreach. Uh, so check out authoritygenius.com. We'll plug that for him. Uh, anything else on the link building front? That is uh, definitely our primary and maybe only link building uh, strategy. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's tough because they, they want some level of authority, uh, the, the journalists do, so they can say, well, at least this person is a, an expert in their field. Uh, and that's been my 
experience with the help of reporter inquiries where I kind of will see those and I have my little Gmail filter where, you know, if it contains the word side hustle, make sure to star it. Otherwise I'm probably not going to uh, read it. But if it does come through with a star, like, okay, there's some, somebody's asking for some side hustle input here. I'll go ahead and throw my hat in the ring. And when I do reply, I'll kind of lead with the credentials like, Hey, I've been hosting this podcast for the last 10 years. It's an award-winning blog. I've written multiple books on this topic. There's a community of 100,000 people. Like try to like really pump myself up in the eyes of this person for what really is just, you know, who even knows. But uh, they, they want that perceived authority so they're not going to get in trouble for citing some random Joe Schmo with a website. Um, yeah. So that's helpful. Um, can you speak to your tech stack at all um, in terms of the the tools that you're using, you mentioned a couple for the keyword research side of things, but anything else that you swear by uh, to help run this business? So Ahrefs is my SEO tool of choice. Um, and actually, one one quick thing on that, because it's kind of coming up in, in conversations with, with my friends too. Like a lot of times people ask, how much money did you need to start this business? My answer was always like a couple hundred bucks, right? Like I paid for a year of hosting. I paid for uh, WordPress template Elementor, but I had the liberty of ha already having an Ahrefs subscription. Um, and if you're like a brand new entrepreneur and you're looking to go the SEO route, you're going to be, if you're using like Ahrefs or Moz or something like that, I mean, that could be 70 or 80 bucks a month. So that is one thing to kind of take into account, um, you know, around startup costs. But yeah. besides that, um, like I said earlier, I, I love the keyword planner tool in Google ads uh, for more accurate search volume. I use a cloud app for like uh, internal, like if I ever need to record a screen um, and send it to a, a team member or someone like that, I, I use cloud app. Um, my website happens to use generate press, uh, which is a very, very lightweight SEO friendly uh, WordPress uh uh, template. Uh, and they also have generate blocks, which is a super lightweight uh, page builder. Uh, and I continue to use Elementor because it's just super, super easy to use. I would love to someday, someday migrate to generate blocks for the reasons I mentioned before, but Elementor is just so sticky that it's been <laughs> tough. <laughs> it's like all these software uh, companies that get their, their tentacles wrapped around you. It's hard to undo some of that stuff. Yeah, I'm, on that. The, I'm on generate press as well. So safety in numbers. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Slack for internal communications. I uh, treat myself to paying $30 a month for superhuman, which um, is a super cool, super robust email client. Uh, probably sounds weird to a lot of people that you would pay money for email. Um, but as someone who is just constantly bugged and annoyed by email, in general, Superhuman has allowed me to finally actually hit inbox zero um, and do a million other things that I just, you know, I don't love email, but at least now I can tolerate it. Um, All right. I've heard a few people mention that. I've yet to check this out myself. It's Superhuman. Legit. Yeah. Yeah. Very it's cool. cool. And you then if the... you like Superhuman, the last thing I'll say is there's a, a nice calendar software called Cron, C O, or sorry, C R O N. And they just came out with a, a really cool mobile app recently too. So, all right, all sorts of cool tools. We'll link those up in uh, in the show notes. You mentioned the Google Keyword Planner. Are you running any paid traffic to the site? I'm not. Uh, I know Alex does uh, with Finn versus Finn, but uh, yeah, I mean, if I if I hate email, I also hate uh, paid search, <laughs> uh, paid marketing efforts in general. It's just you know. I need some time after having done it for so long at my previous full-time position that um, I'd rather just kind of stick to to the organic side of things. Okay. So as far as revenue goes on the site, is it 100% affiliate relationships minus these you know occasional jump the line fees? Are you doing display ads? Anything else that rings the cash register? Yeah. So uh, generally, it's it's affiliate income. Uh, like you said, there's the occasional, uh, cutting the line, uh, and, or, uh, paying for a display ad placement of some sort. Um, but I have never gone with, uh, you know, the display ad companies like Azoic or, uh, Mediavine, 
Um, one reason today would be that our uh, site traffic is too low. Uh, but historically, the main reason why I pushed back on um, implementing something like Mediavine has been that I use, I've used ad blockers for years. Like I'm not a big display ad guy. No. Um, and, uh, even though it's more money in the bank, like I just, I don't <laughs> like ads. That was like one of my pillars. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't want to do this, but I, it, they've kind of, I've come around to it more lately, I guess like money aside, it's like, okay, if I use an ad blocker, no big deal. I won't see the ads. Um, so as long as the ads aren't like intrusive or like, you know, as long as we have some ability to kind of filter them down and at least choose where they display on the website, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to ask about is we talked to Alex and Healy about this as well, was like, you know, what's a good email opt-in offer? You know, we're talking about such a wide variety of different products. What would, what would be a compelling lead magnet to this visitor who is very transaction oriented. They came here for a specific product review to get more information, to kind of just get some validation toward their buying decision. It's like, are you doing anything email capture wise, email marketing wise? No, 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 it doesn't uh, matter. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, no, it does matter. It, it very much matters, I think. And please let me know when you figure out a good uh, lead magnet there. But, um, you know, my hunch is that uh, again, it, it comes back to like, how can I deliver legitimately quality, useful content to my readers, right? Like I'm not, I don't, the reason I haven't spun up, uh, a robust email marketing program has been a bandwidth, but B also like, I just haven't felt as though I have that many interesting things to force my way into someone's email inbox, you know, like obviously I could, uh, advertise like exclusive deals, um, on brands that people are, have, have, uh, proven that they're already interested in, but it kind of stops there. Um, I think that, you know, when I eventually do, um, take on the email, email marketing initiative, like I should, it's probably going to involve some sort of digital content that I could just share for free. Right. So like, the first thing that comes to mind would be like, how do you like, you know, a little PDF document that can give you like, you could just keep it handy on your desktop. Um, and it can just remind you of like the top tips for, uh, maximizing your virtual therapy, right? Like I started virtual therapy a few weeks ago and I was kind of in that boat myself where I was like, I've never done this before. I haven't been to therapy in years anyway. So I got to my second meeting with my therapist and I was like, what should, like, do I come prepared to this? Like, what do you want to talk about? And she's like, I don't know. What do you want to talk about? So I think if you could <laughs> just share like something like that with people, obviously you could include tips from an actual therapist or psychiatrist. Yeah. Um, then, and it's free. Like, sure. I'll give you my email for that. That sounds great. Yeah. Something that, you know, appeals to this broad health seeking self-improvement type of audience and yeah, it almost it's hard to say well, what would be the immediate roi on that where you could you know start to curate helpful articles you know on that every week and it's just, it's just another touch point to say when you have the next review product or you have something that might be compelling or interesting to them and even you start to collect you know the user feedback uh you know over time like oh this person bought that home gym through our link. And, you know, now it's six months later, you know, these are the results that you, know, you now you have kind of that user generated content piece of it that the other sites aren't going to have, but yeah, definitely a long-term play that may not have immediate uh, ROI. Um, yeah. And then the other thing I was curious about was, is this hundred percent written content, but is there a video component? Are you doing anything YouTube wise? No. And it, it, you know, it's, it's good of you to mention it right after email marketing, because it's another area that um, you can't argue the value of, of video and YouTube. I'm someone who doesn't pay for Netflix. I don't pay for Hulu, nothing like that. But I do pay $15 a month for YouTube premium. Like I absolutely love it. I spend all day on it, even if it's just, you know, background audio. But yeah, there's so, so much work that goes into video creation. 
Um, and of course, I could outsource a lot of those uh, specific responsibilities, but it's also the factor of like, I don't like being behind the camera. So how am I going to approach that? Like, yeah, hire someone be the to personality do that for me? Yeah, like it's, it's really tough. And it's just, there's a lot of different questions that you have to answer that you don't necessarily have to answer if you're just making a, a blog with written content. But, you know, there's, there's plenty of evidence out there also that um, articles that include YouTube videos tend to perform quite well. And also we're seeing an increase in um, Google's decision to serve up uh videos, whether it's YouTube or TikTok videos in SERPs for certain queries. So yeah. it kills me that I don't actually have a presence on YouTube or whatever, but I would, I would love to someday. And, you know, if, if, if Sunmaster, um, knock on wood, if, if Sunmaster just died tomorrow, then I think, uh, I would not pursue a full-time position and I would just jump straight into YouTube. Yeah. I'm sure there's somebody listening who either we will raise their hand and offer to make those videos uh, for you uh, as their side hustle, or somebody would be like, Hey, Matt, come on, you know, there's these AI tools that will take this article that you've already written and, you know, turn that into a YouTube video with a you know voiceover. You don't even have to show your face. I'm sure something like that, if it doesn't exist, may exist shortly. Well, Matt, this has been awesome. Um, what surprised you the most over the last couple of years of building and growing this thing? The, the biggest thing that has surprised me is like, all I had to do was put the time in. Nothing that I do is rocket science. I'm, I know a lot of people on your show have said that, but truly it's not. You're just putting the time in. Um, and as long as you're going about things the the right way, good things will probably follow at some point in time. So it's just been really cool. And, and it's something that I'm, I'm just so, so glad that I actually did that initial work of building this side hustle up. Because again, now it's a full-time hustle. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's a great business that, you know, it's not, it's not totally passive. Cause like you said, well, I'm still working on it and improving the existing content, creating new content, but it's definitely time leveraged in that I can create this article and have it sit out there for months or sometimes years at a time driving traffic and revenue. And by the way, while it's doing that, it is also adding equity to the business where, okay, even at 15, 20 grand a month, that's still a multi hundred thousand dollar asset that you built. And, you know, if that revenue doubles, all of a sudden that uh, equity component doubles as well. But what's next for you? Where do you want to take it uh, for the rest of this year? So I'm, I'm focused on uh, scaling the business uh, throughout the rest of this year. So I hired a virtual assistant just the other day, who's helping me manage a lot of the website and also the entire design component of the business, which is an area that I have not previously focused. So um, I'm just looking to scale wherever I can, uh, delegate different tasks outside of myself, empower people and teach them everything that I know so that that just hopefully frees up more time for me to actually focus on things that um, I need to be focusing my time on. Yeah, very good. Um, I think that's something that resonates with me too. This often, this, uh, uh, you know, never any task of scale and delegation and, you know, where, where's my time really best spent? What could I delegate and outsource and work smarter instead of working harder? But again, uh, Matt, I appreciate you joining me. Zenmasterwellness.com. Check him out over there. Let's wrap this thing up with your number one tip for Side Hustle Nation. Just trust the process. Uh, there's nothing wrong with just having a little bit of complete blind faith in uh, the mere possibility that things could really take off for you. Um, like I said, this was just a little pandemic side hustle for me. <laughs> and now three years later, doesn't feel like three years, but three years later, <laughs> I'm just, I've built a legitimate business up and I'm working for myself and it's been the greatest thing ever. But truly, like I, obviously I, I kicked this whole thing off um, as a way to build some, some side income, but it was other than that complete blind faith. Um, and if, if you told me that three years later, I was making $200 of beer money per month, I'd still be stoked like that. Yeah. We would have been a, a legitimate win. So who knows where the ceiling actually is just chug forward and make yourself proud would be my advice. 
Yeah, very cool. Trust that process. Putting in the time, I think that was really interesting. Well, what's the most surprising thing? It's just, you know, how simple it necessarily was just putting in the time and having, you know, following, of course, the SEO best practices and building out super helpful content that, again, is in depth. But not when you said 50 articles, it's like, oh, you know, in when you frame it that way, it's like, that's not that much. I, you know, I could do that. It seems, seems more achievable. And especially if I'm tackling that niche from a bunch of different angles and, you know, building that topical authority up, I think that makes a lot of sense. So again, zenmasterwellness.com, check them out over there. If you are ready to start your own website, sidehustlewebsite.com is where to go. That's my quick video series on how to get yourself online quickly and affordably, sidehustlewebsite.com. If you're new to the show, thank you for tuning in. I would love to build you a custom curated playlist. Just hit up hustle.show, answer a few short multiple choice questions, and we'll get you on your way with that personalized playlist that you can add to your device. Start making more money today. Again, hustle.show for that one. Big thanks to Matt for sharing his insight. Thanks to Uber Eats and Elo Health for sponsoring this week. You can hit up sidehustlenation.com slash deals for all the latest offers from our sponsors all in one place. Thank you for supporting the advertisers that support the show. That is it for me. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you're finding value in the show, make sure to text it to a friend. Hey, check this thing out. Until next time, let's go out there and make something happen. And I'll catch you in the next edition of the Side Hustle Show. Hustle on.